Hey everybody and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. And um, as you can see I've not got the game box here because I'm going to be doing a setup and rules video for Root which is just come and completed its Kickstarter. It was successfully funded and this is the print and play version of the game that was sent to all the Kickstarter backers. Root is like a strategic war game for two to four players. I reckon it probably takes about 60 to 90 minutes to play, depending on the number of players you've got, but uh, that might vary a lot based on uh, the fact that it's a print and play version of the game. And um, in the print and play version, you've got four factions uh, who represent different denizens of the woodland. And uh, you've got uh, the Marquis de Cat, who's the Lord of the Woodland, and all the other factions are sort of vying for power with him. You've got the old eerie order, which is like the birds who live in the forest, and they used to be the lords of the woodland, and now they're not. You've got the Woodland Alliance, who are sort of the Robin Hood-esque rogues and scoundrels trying to sort of uh, take back power in the name of what's right, in the name of the people. And then you've got the Vagabond, who's sort of like a vigilante jack of all trades, who's really here to just sort of profit as best he can off of the social turmoil and uh, the conflict. The game is from uh, Leader Games and uh, it's designed by Colin Whirler and Kevin Ferrin. Um, and it's a sort of a spiritual successor to their other game, Vast the Crystal Caverns, which you may have heard of, where uh, adventurers are trying to steal treasure, well, an adventurer is trying to steal treasure from a dragon. All the other players are playing different roles of uh, that adventure, including the dragon itself. Um, in this one, we're all these different factions. They all have very different play styles, um, and they are ordered. So the Marquis is number one, the Eerie is number two, the Woodland Alliance is three, and the Vagabond is four. And as you add players, you will add roles. So uh, in a two-player game, you would play with the Marquis de Cat versus the old Eerie Order. In a three-player game, the third player becomes the Woodland Alliance. And in a four-player game, the fourth player becomes the Vagabond. Now, I did say it was uh, print and play, and uh, this is the version I've made up, which is about the extent of my print and play abilities. But um, there, the, in the Kickstarter version, you'll have another faction. There'll be all kinds of different characters. I believe there's two different kinds of boards as well. So I'm very excited for that to come. In the meantime, I'm just going to go through what comes in the print and play version, and I'll talk you through the rules of how to play, especially with all these different factions, because they're asymmetrical. In Root, every player is competing in different ways to get to 40 victory points. Each faction has different ways of getting to 40 victory points, but there are some common themes designed to sort of simplify some of the motion of the game. And those common themes are the movement, the combat, and the crafting. So what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about those three, then I'll look at each of the different factions and talk about how to set them up on the board. So first off, what have I got set up on the table here? Well, I've got all of the print and play components, plus a few extra bits and pieces they asked you to pick up. So in the print and play version, you get four player boards, you get the board, you get a deck of cards, which comes with uh, many different kinds of cards, as well as four alternate victory cards. You get a whole bunch of different card, a whole deck of different cards, and these cards have uh, a lot of text on them because they perform a whole ton of different functions that are unlocked depending on which faction you are and um, depending on how you play them with the different factions. In this deck, you'll see two primarily two different kinds of cards, cards that look like this and cards that look like this, ambush cards. You've also got four alternate victory condition cards, one for each suit in the game. The cards are all divided into four suits that match the different nations living in the woodland forest. You've got birds, rabbits, mice, and foxes. On each faction board, we've also got the different tokens that comes with them. The Marquis de Cat comes with 15 uh, building tokens here to go on this section of their board, plus one of each to go onto the board during setup. The Old Eerie Order has two trusted Vizier cards, as well as four different leader types. We've also got a bunch of different roosts uh, set up, and uh, you'll notice uh, that uh, some have stars and some do not. There should be four with stars and three without. The Woodland Alliance has three secret hideouts down here on the bottom of their player board, plus 
four strongholds here on the stronghold track of their board. I've also got a little cube here, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Here for the Vagabond, we've got two different kinds of characters. You can choose which Vagabond you want to be, Roger the Raccoon or the Crafting Beaver. We've also got a whole ton of little item tokens here. And uh, these four tokens here, which are match these, but are actually called ruins. And I'll explain what these do later on. I've also got uh, a little man here and a little cube here. Those are obviously not from the print and play, and I'll talk about those in a bit. And I've got uh, this item legend here. This comes with the print and play version, and this tells you a lot of information about what all these different icons mean. In addition to that, I have 25 cubes in three colors. I've got 15 wood tokens. I've got two D4, and I've got a man uh, and a matching cube. Now all those ladder tokens obviously didn't come with the print and play version of the game and that's because uh, those are extra things that you'll need to sort of supply from your own board gaming uh, store or stash if you want to play the game. And the Marquis de Cat, the Old Eerie Order and the Woodland Alliance will each be assigned 25 uh, cubes. The Marquis de Cat also gets the 15 wood tokens. The 2d4s are used for combat, I'll explain that later. And then the single cube and the uh, man token, those go to the Vagabond. Now, in order to control the forest and reach your 40 victory points, you will need to build buildings, you'll need to move soldiers around, you'll need to craft things, but you'll also need to uh, play into your specific victory conditions. The Marquis de Cat likes to build buildings in an attempt to establish the empire which he's captured. The Old Eerie Order are looking to build roosts, attempting to re-establish their old empire. The Woodland Alliance, they get points for uh, hatching conspiracies and secret plans in the background and schemes. And the Vagabond gets points for essentially doing things that make him infamous. He's looking to become famous and sort of get ahead of the game on this uh, in this social turmoil. So he'll be uh, gaining points for killing people and stealing things. But he'll also be gaining points for lending his support and aiding people. And uh, just sort of actions that affect the course of history. The Vagabond doesn't build any buildings, but the other three races do. Here I've got a sawmill, a roost, and a hideout. And when you're building a building, you can place it on any open slot in the um, clearing. Now, there are these red slots that will contain ruins, but if the ruins are gone, the slot is clear and you can build in it. Some buildings like the Woodland Alliance's hideout can be built anywhere. And some buildings, like the roost and the sawmill, can only be built in clearings that the player rules. What does rules mean? Rules simply means that you have a majority stake in that clearing. So, for example, if I were to add a single bird soldier, now I'm using these black cubes here to represent my bird soldiers, but uh, you can assign any color cubes that you want when you set the game up. They've sort of got a brown theme overall, so you might want to try to find some brown ones. But uh, I've got these black ones, and uh, if I put this one in here, there's now a bird warrior and a roost, which means that the bird player has majority and counts as controlling this clearing. This is called presence, and presence is equal to the total sum of your buildings plus your warriors. When we're doing movement, it's really very simple. If you control the clearing you're moving out of, you can move to any other clearing that you want. In this case, the bird people could move from this clearing to any of the three adjacent clearings because they rule this clearing. They have four presents to the Marquis de Cat's one presence. If the Marquis wants to move out of this territory, it's a little more complicated for him. You see, he can only actually move to this territory here, which he, can, he rules. He cannot move uh, into this territory because the Woodland Alliance rule it. He cannot move into this territory because he and the Woodland Alliance are drawn. You may have noticed I put down a Woodland Alliance token here. I originally had a um, Eerie Order token here, which wouldn't work for this example because when tied for presence, the Eerie Order wins ties, meaning that this clearing is actually controlled by the Eerie Order. So if the Marquis de Cat wants to move out of this territory here, he can go into this territory he controls here, he can go into this territory because no one controls it, and he can ask the permission of the Woodland Alliance player if he may enter this territory. Movement for the Vagabond works a little differently. He ignores all of these restrictions and goes where he pleases. Furthermore, he can actually move through the forests as though these are clearings themselves. As he's the only one that can go into the forest, he cannot battle there, 
and uh, he can repair his items if he ends his turn there. Which leads me into the next thing, combat. Combat is actually very simple in this game. If the Old Eerie Order were to initiate a battle, everybody has some way to initiate a battle on their turn. The Old Eerie Order can do it in this clearing here. They would battle against the Marquis de Cat. So the first thing that happens is that the defender may retreat. Now if the defender's retreating, he has to move to an adjacent clearing that his faction rules. So the Marquis de Cat could not retreat to here or to here and must retreat to here. When you retreat from combat, you will uh, take hits based on the number of uh, people who are retreating from the combat. So if your army is only one or two, you will take zero hits. Three to four, you will take one hit. Five to six, you will take two. And seven or more people in your army, you will take three hits. The attacker can also add additional hits using an ambush card. The suit of the ambush card has to match the type of clearing. Um, this is a bird card, so it's wild and can apply to any clearing. That's the clearing in which the battle is taking place. <clears throat> if he does not retreat, then uh, he has an opportunity to play an ambush card. The ambush card allows him to add hits to his final score. What does that mean? Well, once the ambush cards are played, the attacking player rolls 2d4. Now, these will be d12 in the final Kickstarter version of the game, or the final uh, produced version of the game, but uh, they are supposed to read 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, we're using d4s here, um, but uh, in the final production, I believe they're d12s with multiple, uh, multiple numbers on each face of each type, but uh, it should be even. And uh, you can do it however you want. You can count the 4 as the 0, or you can just use the score minus 1. Um, let's count the fours as zero. So in this conflict, we'll roll the two dice, and I've rolled a zero and a two. Um, now the zero will be all will be applied to the defender, and the two will be applied to the attacker. The attacker rolls these dice, and the attacker is always assigned the higher number. The defender is assigned the lower number, and this is because the attacker should get some return for their investment in uh, this battle. And uh, then you remove. Um, soldiers based on the number of attacks that were uh, the number of hits that were scored and uh, so in this case the Marquis de Cat would remove two things or in this case their one soldier and uh, because they scored a zero the Old Eerie Order does not lose any soldiers. In this example here the uh, Old Eerie Order is attacking the Marquis de Cat in their clearing and I've rolled a one and a two so the two is assigned to the attackers and the one is assigned to the offenders the eerie order would lose one. Now this is simultaneous, so it doesn't really matter the order in which you remove them. But uh, the Marquis de Cat is going to lose two, which means they're going to lose this soldier, and they're also going to lose this sawmill. Now uh, you will always uh, excess hits will always be transferred onto buildings, and um, if the Marquis de Cat had a wood here at this sawmill that had been saved up, the Marquis de Cat can remove wood as well as buildings, but. Uh, the Old Eerie Order and the Woodland Alliance cannot because they don't use wood resources. So um, just any sort of token like this in the uh, clearing for those three factions would also be removed. And uh, for every building removed in this way, the uh, attacker receives one victory point. It's worth noting that when you're calculating damage in a fight, you can only ever do as many hits as you have soldiers. So in this case, both armies can do three hits because they have more than three soldiers. But in this example here, the Marquis de Cat can only ever do one damage no matter what he rolls because he's only got one warrior. So that's combat. It works a little differently for the Vagabond, but I'll talk about that a bit later when I get to explaining the Vagabond's whole role because you might not be using him and you might not care about that. So now let's talk about crafting. On these cards that you'll be getting in your hand, there are uh, all kinds of different bits and pieces of information. Down here you've got the Conspiracy, which will be used by the Woodland Alliance. Up here you've got the Suit of the card, which is important in a whole ton of different contexts. We'll get to that later. And on the side here you've got the Crafting Element. Now the Crafting Element is typically a sort of a, a one-use ability or a passive ongoing ability and uh, has a cost here on the left. And uh, if it's a passive ability, for example, the Tax Collector here says, at the start of daylight, steal a random card from a local player. So daylight is a phase in a turn and uh, you will steal, you select a player and steal a card at random from their hand and that'll happen every turn. 
By comparison here, we've got a sword. And this says, when crafted, score two victory points and then discard it. So in this case, you would craft the sword, you would discard the card and just gain two victory points straight away. What this means is that uh, you will also gain a sword item. Items such as this are only used if you're playing with the Vagabond character. So if you're not using the Vagabond, you can ignore this completely. If you are using the Vagabond, then place this icon on your player board. And uh, it, can be given, it will be given to the Vagabond when he gives you a gift. So this is sort of like an exchange that you would have with the Vagabond. If this card was crafted by the Vagabond, then he gains this item in his exhausted pool. So I showed you the cost, which is a selection of symbols belonging to each of the three animal nations. And uh, it doesn't include bird symbols because the bird is random, so you can use the bird symbols for anything. But uh, you also need to... Um, well, each faction crafts in a slightly different way. But they've all got crafting buildings or some kind of crafting mechanic. The Marquis de Cat builds uh, workshops. Here we can see the workshops on the Marquis de Cat's board. The Marquis de Cat also starts with one workshop, which you can place on the board at the start of the game. If the Marquis de Cat has a workshop in a clearing, then he counts as having a craft symbol for that clearing. So for example, in this situation, the Marquis de Cat is one away from making a sword because he has one fox symbol. Note that each symbol can only be used uh, for crafting once per turn. So if the Marquis de Cat were to use this fox symbol here to craft this anvil, which costs one fox, he could not then go on to use it later in combination with another symbol to produce the sword. This fox symbol would sort of count as spent for that turn. The Woodland Alliance builds strongholds, which work in exactly the same way as the Marquis de Cat's workshops. The Old Eerie Order uses these roosts with stars on. Note that these are distinct from the roosts without stars. These do not provide crafting goods. So in this case, the uh, Old Eerie Order gains one uh, fox symbol for their crafting purposes. But uh, if they had a roost over here with no star symbol, they would not get a benefit for crafting. Because he doesn't build buildings, the Vagabond's crafting works a little differently. The Vagabond has these tokens up here which he'll unlock over the course of the game and the tokens can be spent on his turn to do different actions and they come back so he increases his action pool as he progresses throughout the game. One of the tokens he has is called the Anvil and it looks like this. So the Vagabond can exhaust these to craft things when he is, uh, as he wanders around the forest. Coming back to our cle clearing of crafting here, our Vagabond has entered the clearing which means that he can now spend anvils from his action pool to add fox symbols to a crafting endeavor. And this is because he's in a fox clearing. If he were to spend the anvils in a bunny clearing, they would be bunny symbols. And if he were in a mouse clearing, they would be mouse symbols. This means that in the print and play version, there are gonna be some uh, upgrades that are simply beyond the ability of the Vagabond to make. For example, the Royal Claim, because the Vagabond cannot discard because the Vagabond can only gain crafting symbols for the clearing they're in and cannot be in three different clearings at the same time. It's worth noting as well that sometimes the crafting cost on the card is not the same as the suit. In this case, to build a bank, you need two crafting mice symbols, uh, but uh, it's a fox suit card. When you're crafting a passive improvement like the bank here, you slide it horizontally over the top of your player board where it sits to indicate that you have that upgrade bonus for the rest of the game. So now that we've looked at these sort of shared concepts of crafting, movement, and combat, um, let's have a look at uh, the setup for each of the different factions. I'll be setting up a four-player game here to show you the four distinct factions, but uh, as I said, you can play with as few as two players, in which case you'd only use factions one and two, the Marquis de Cat and the Old Eerie Order. So the Marquis de Cat will set up first, and the Marquis de Cat will start by putting one of their soldiers in every single clearing on the board. This includes the Keep and the uh, Eerie Homeland. The Marquis de Cat also starts with one of each building type. The Sawmill, which is the Razor Blade, will be deployed here in the Keep. Then he'll have a Workshop and a Recruiter. And these will be placed in any of the three adjacent clearings to the keep. And uh, the Marquis de Cat player can decide how those are placed. The Old Eerie Order starts by uh, putting down the first roost from their player track here 
into the Eerie Homeland. They also start with six warriors in the Eerie Homeland. The Old Eerie Order must also choose a leader to play. The leader will start with a special ability and also tell you where your trusted viziers start. Don't worry, we'll talk about the trusted viziers later. For now, I'm going to start with the charismatic leader because uh, I like to recruit soldiers and move them around. So this shows the recruit action and the move action on it, which means that I take my trusted viziers and put them in those slots on the decree part of my player board. This will be explained in detail when we get to the old eerie orders uh, rules explanation. But here's the recruit spot on the decree and the soldier movement spot on the decree. And my trusted viziers will go down there. Then it's over to the Woodland Alliance who takes one of their secret hideouts and places it in any legal clearing on the board. In this case, that's basically anything except for the keep, the uh, fox here, and the eerie homeland here. And they can play it in any only open slot, only including the red slots if the vagabond is not playing. You must put down the secret hideout of the correct nation corresponding to the clearing. So we looked at the clearings earlier. They are mouse, bunny, and fox. And we've got uh, a mouse secret uh, hideout here. We've got a bunny one, and we've got a fox one as well. So uh, I'll take the mouse secret hideout and put that down in a mouse clearing. The Woodland Alliance also starts with a warrior at the hideout. Finally, it's the vagabond to set up. So he will choose a character. He can either be the crafting beaver, or Roger the Raccoon. I believe there will be more options for this in the uh, full version of the game. And uh, so I'm going to be Roger the Raccoon as my uh, Vagabond. So I will gain the starting items. That's four icons that match the symbols on the bottom of my uh, card there. So I'll gain one boot, two torches, and a sword. <clears throat> and I'll put these under the available section of my player board here. My character also has a special ability. It says, if stealing, plus one combat strength. The crafting beaver can build buildings for other players and gain victory points for doing so. Finally, if you're playing with the Vagabond, take these red ringed action tokens, these are called ruins, and place them on the board and uh, randomize them as well. So we're looking for these red building slots we spotted earlier, and we'll um, take one of these random uh, tokens here and just put it face down one for each one for each red ringed building slot the vagabond then collects one soldier token from each of the other players in the game and puts them on their reputation track finally the vagabond puts his person token on the board and he puts it in any forest that he wishes. Note that the forests do not include the forests around the outside of the board, but any of the forests that are between the clearings, which count as spaces for the Vagabond. Our Vagabond has decided to go here in this forest because it gives him access to ruins which he can explore for vips later on. Now that that's all set up, let's grab one more soldier token from each player, in addition to that Vagabond cube we set out earlier, and we'll put these on the zero space of our victory point tracker here. Finally, we'll take our uh, deck of cards and we'll deal one, uh, three to each player as their starting hand. Now you see these victory cards, the alternate victory conditions? If you're playing with four or more players, shuffle them all into the deck. If you're playing with three or fewer players, take out the Coalition and Chaos victories, only keep the Economic and Military victories, and then shuffle them into the deck. So now that we're all set up, we're ready to begin playing. Turn order is always the same. It starts with the Market Cat, then the Old Eerie Order play, then the Woodland Alliance, and finally the Vagabond. So the Marquis de Cat will take their entire turn, then the Old Eerie Order will do their entire turn, the Woodland Alliance will do their entire turn, the Vagabond will do their entire turn, and then we're back to the Marquis de Cat, who will do their entire turn again. And that will repeat until someone reaches 40 victory points, 
or gives up their victory points for one of the alternate victory conditions and wins that way. So each of these turns will be uh, comprised of three phases, the birdsong phase, the daylight phase, and the evening phase. Birdsong is typically just sort of preparation and setup. Then the daylight phase is where the uh, players will take most of their actions, and the evening phase is sort of a cleanup phase. Now, because of the asymmetrical nature of the game, the uh, and the, the way the turn order works, in the uh, Marquis de Cats fa evening phase, we'll see that some of the stuff that happens affects all of the players. So it's very important that these are done in the correct order and that the races are played in the correct order. So let's have a look now at the Marquis de Cat in more detail. So this is the player board for the Marquis de Cat, the first player in the uh, game. And uh, it gives you a little bit of story up here. Uh, then it tells you about how you score victory points. Finally, it tells you about a special ability, and uh, then it gives you your starting income and hand size. Note that income in this game, a little misleadingly perhaps, is actually referring to cards. So income is your card draw. And when it says that you draw your income, you actually draw a number of cards equal to um, your starting draw, which is one, plus uh, any other income you've gained over the course of the game. In this case, you gain income by uh, building recruiters. The Marquis de Cat also has a special ability, Field Hospitals. When a cat warrior is lost in combat, you can spend a card, discard a card, to move the warrior to the keep instead of putting them back in the warrior pool. So it says here that the Marquis de Cat gains victory points by building buildings and crafting items. Now we saw earlier on the sword, for example, that you could uh, build the sword and then discard it to gain uh, two victory points. And uh, that's what that's talking about. But uh, it also has uh, build buildings, and the Marquis de Cat, we'll see here on his player board, every time he puts down a building, he gains the victory points listed here under the building. Now, the buildings themselves, their type is here, and their cost is up here in wood. So, how does uh, one build the buildings? Well, you pay the cost in wood. And how do we get wood? Well, let's take a look at this track here, because this has all the information we need. So you can see here that the first uh, part of the Marquis de Cat's turn is birdsong, in which case they'll take one wood from their wood tokens and uh, they'll add that wood to each sawmill on the woodland so for every sawmill you've built you'll gain a wood now you start the game with one so you'll have one wood that you put on the board at the start of the game but of course you can build more sawmills which will get you more wood income so at the start of the game the marquee de cat will put down wood on each sawmill that he has built and then you've got the daylight phase which is where the vast majority of the turn takes place this little box here indicates that the Marquis de Cat has three actions they can take on their turn. This also indicates that the Marquis de Cat can discard bird cards to gain additional actions. I wasn't sure if this had to be done before performing any other actions, and I haven't actually had a ruling on that yet, so uh, it's, you should clarify that with your players beforehand. I feel as though that the Marquis should decide whether or not uh, they will be discarding bird cards for actions at the start of the daylight phase, but that could be incorrect. They've then got six actions that they can take with these. They can perform a battle. This is what we looked at earlier. If you have uh, warriors in the same clearing as some other warriors, you can have a battle with those warriors. You can spend an action to move twice. Again, we looked at movement at the start of the video. This allows you to move uh, twice, and I believe that can be any uh, number of warriors from one clearing to another, or um, any number of warriors to one clearing and then another clearing. So you can move the same group twice, or you can move two groups once. Then uh, you've got your craft here. Again, we looked at that earlier. That just indicates if you have workshops, you can pay the price. Remember that each workshop gains you one animal symbol, and you can only spend each animal symbol once. So uh, you can craft based on the amount of uh, animal symbols and workshops you have. Then you can take a recruit action. And this says place one warrior at each recruiter. Alliance outrage increases. So uh, the recruiters, which are here, you start with one on the board. When you take this action, you take one warrior from your pool and add it to each recruiter. Note that uh, we did begin the game with 25 warriors, but then we took some out to add to uh, the score tracker and to also put on the uh, Vagabonds board. So uh, if you run out of warriors, you can't place anymore, but uh, you can still take the action and just decide where you're going to put the ones that you do have left. Um, and then um, this will put up the Alliance Outrage because the woodland creatures in the uh, Rebellious Alliance are very upset that you're recruiting their friends to be soldiers in your army of evil, cat evil, feline evil. This is the outrage track here, and that will increase by one step when the Marquis de Cat takes a recruit action. 
There's also the build action. In a clearing you rule, build a building using any wood connected through cle ruled clearings. So this is very important. In order to uh, build a building, you must rule the clearing in which you're building it. This isn't always the case for all buildings. Hideouts can be built in clearings that the Woodland Alliance player does not rule. And uh, it says using any wood connected through ruled clearings. So it's the beginning of the Marquis de Cat's turn and he gets wood here at his sawmill and wood here at the other sawmill. Now, the Marquis de Cat cannot build in this clearing or this clearing because he does not rule them. Um, he can build in this clearing because he does rule it. And uh, if he wants to spend two wood to build in this clearing, he can do so because the wood can go along this path of ruled clearings. Note that uh, if for whatever reason the bird folk took over the uh, keep here, then uh, the Marquis de Cat could not transport wood from this sawmill here to this clearing here because there is no paths that he rules all, uh, all along. When you're building buildings with the Marquis de Cat, you uh, have to spend this wood cost up here, so you start off with buildings getting uh, fairly cheap, and then they get more expensive as uh, you build more and more of them. And um, when you uh, put them down, you gain the victory points that are hidden underneath. And it's worth uh, noting that uh, you get income bonuses for recruiters on uh, some of the slots. It's also worth noting that uh, it can actually be beneficial to having your buildings destroyed, because then they come back here and you can replace them again for less wood. Remember, that's how you get victory points, by building buildings. And also crafting items. The final action the Marquis King de Cat can take is spend three cards of a single type. In each clearing of that type that you rule, remove all opponent buildings scoring two VP per buildings. Opponents who lost a building draw one card for each lost. That's crazy good. That's super powerful. Of course, you do need to have three cards of the same type, and then you have to match them to a clearing type. Then you have to rule it, even though enemy buildings are in it. So there's a lot of conditions there. But you get to destroy your opponent's buildings, which is great. And you score two VP for every building destroyed. That's awesome. So this is a very powerful action. And that's, again, one of the uh, Marquis' actions. Once he's spent his actions doing three of these things, or more if he discarded bird cards, then it's his evening phase. And in the evening phase for the Marquis de Cat, all players draw income. This is really important um, because this is when everybody gets their income. Then uh, it says discard down to hand limit. Note that that's only the Marquis de Cat. So all players draw cards. Income, remember, is just card draw. And then discards down to their hand limit. That's only the Marquis de Cat. His starting hand limit is five, which we know from the top right symbol. And then once he's done discarding, it's over to the Old Eerie Order. So now we're on to the Old Eerie Order, roll number two. And uh, it tells you the story about how uh, you had a moment of weakness and the cats came in and killed all your people and now you're trying to recapture your birthright. You've got uh, victory points. You score every evening for the number of roosts you've built. That's down here. So this is like a sort of a uh, ongoing income, unlike the Marquis de Cat, who just gets a one-off thing every time he puts a building down, you're going to gain two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight victory points every turn based on the number of roosts that you've built. You also get uh, victory points for crafting items and destroying wood or buildings. You've got uh, these special abilities here. It says the Lords of the Forest, you rule any clearings where you're tied in presence. So you break ties, everyone else, nobody's the ruler if they're drawn. You've also got Jealous fight Fiefs. Now this is a, um, a detrimental ability. It says you can only place one roost per clearing. So even if you're in one of those really cool clearings with three open slots, it doesn't matter, you can only play one roost per clearing because the lords of all of your fiefs, your fiefs, your roosts, don't want to share their clearing with other bird folk. So the starting resources for the Old Eerie Order are four uh, are one income and you also have a hand size of four. Now things are a little different over here in the old eerie order. You've got bird song. Add one bird card or two non-bird cards to your decree. Well what the hell is a decree? Well we'll find out that in a minute. Then it says daylight. There's only like there's nothing here. Remember the market cat had six actions? What's going on here? You've got two things you can do craft, reform, and then resolve the decree. Well, crafting, we spoke about that earlier. We looked at crafting earlier. Instead of workshops, you're looking at the locations of your roosts with stars. 
So uh, if we have a look along our roost track here, we can see that the roost you started with, which is in your Erie homeland, which is a fox area, is got a star in it. So you start with one fox for crafting purposes, but uh, you've got another three Eries here with stars on that you can put out on the board. It's gonna be a little tricky, obviously, because they're jealous and you can't have two in one clearing. And uh, also you're gonna have to try and place them in such a way that uh, they get into the clearings you need to unlock the, uh, the crafting symbols that you need. Then you've got the reform action, which allows you to move one card of uh, the same type to a new slot. Well, what on earth does that mean? Well, this symbol here, this uh, means card of any suit. So there's four suits, obviously. There's bunnies, bunnies, mice, foxes, and birds. And uh, birds are always wild. So you can, uh, if you use a bird card, you can move one card of any type to a new slot. If you discard a fox, you can move one fox to a new slot. What's a slot? Well, this is all about the decree. Basically, the old Erie order is sort of like um, England during the monarchy. You've got a, a leader, who's your birdman here, and uh, they're ruling over the whole of the Erie order. But then you've got the clearings, which are fiefs, which have their own lords. And the, uh, the lords carry out the orders of the uh, kingbird, and um, those orders are the decree. And uh, you've got to carry out all the orders in the decree in sequential order, and uh, you've got to set that up during the daylight phase of the Eerie. So now we'll take a look at the decree, but the, uh, tr the, the challenge is that if you put down an action that for whatever reason you can't complete, then uh, the Eerie is thrown into turmoil as uh, everyone doubts the uh, lords and the leadership of the king, and basically you have to end your turn immediately and you don't get any victory points, which sucks. So the decree is along the bottom of the bird board here. And you've got four different actions sort of here. And um, these actions are going to happen every round, provided there's a card underneath activating them. You've got place a warrior at a roost in this clearing type. So when this action triggers, you will put down one of your warrior cubes from your supply into a clearing with a type that matches the card you've played. So in this case, we've got one of our trusted Vizier cards, who is simply a bird for these purposes. Now, if you remember, the reason the trusted Viziers are here is because we chose a charismatic leader at the start of the game, and so we have a recruit action and a move action here. So our Viziers are in the recruit and move slots. If we'd taken a different kind of leader, for example, this builder, then we'd be in the recruit and build slots. Now, the Viziers can be moved using the reform action, but uh, at the moment, we've got uh, our roost, so we'll put down a warrior in a clearing with this type. Birds are wild, so this can be any type, but we might have played a card during our bird song step into this slot that's not a bird. If it's a rabbit card, for example, we put down a warrior in a rabbit clearing. Then we've got move at least one warrior from this clearing type. So that's important to note because it's a little... Um, Anti, it's a little unintuitive. You've got a bird here, which means you can move warriors from any clearing to any clearing. However, if we had a specific suit in here, for example, our bunny friend again, then uh, we must move at least one warrior out of a bunny type clearing, not to a bunny type clearing. They can go to any clearing provided it meets with the rules of movement, which we looked at earlier. But if uh, if uh, there's uh, if you don't have any warriors left in a bunny clearing, you're gonna go into turmoil. So you've got to move at least one warrior out of a bunny type clearing. If uh, you can't do that legally, again, you'll go into turmoil. So be careful. Now, if we've got a card down here, we would activate the battle action. And uh, it says in this clearing type, battle. So in this case, we would look for a bunny clearing uh, with another faction's warriors, and we would initiate a battle there. Again, if there are no warriors and we put a card down here, or we're not present in any bunny clearings and we put a card down here, we cannot complete this action and we'll go into turmoil. Remember, we looked at battle earlier. So if you trigger a battle in a bunny clearing, then the battle is carried out as before. Finally, we've got the place a roost in a clearing of this type, the build action. So in this case, we will put down a uh, roost in a clearing, which matches the card here, and we rule. So in this case, we would have to put a roost in a clearing, in a bunny clearing, uh, that we also ruled. And uh, that's a little tricky because, you know, uh, we might not necessarily rule the clearing yet. We we're hoping that the outcome of the previous battle might help us to rule the clearing. Um, we might, uh, for whatever reason, you know, be unable to complete this action, in which case we'll go into turmoil. But if we don't, then that's great. 
Now let's uh, quickly go back to this bird song. Remember, it says add one bird card or two non-bird cards to your decree. So uh, we can add two non-bird cards to our decree. These can be the same suit or different suits um, when we add them to the decree and uh, we can add them to any of the four slots. We can also double up so we can put down uh, the two cards that we add into the recruit action here, in which case we'll do three recruit actions and then uh, we'll do one move action and no battle and no placement of roosts either. And uh, remember that uh, we place a warrior in a roost in this clearing type. So uh, if we put down our bunny and our fox in this position, we will have to place one warrior in any clearing, then one warrior in a fox clearing and one in a rabbit clearing. So the way you'll find the decree working is that the um, old Eerie Order player will continue to add cards from their hand every round, either adding two of cards from any suit or one bird card and uh, as I said they can add these to the same column or to different columns in any kind of order they want but as they continue to add cards these will build up and build up into a unmanageable number of actions so while there is potential here for the old eerie order to have as many actions as they have cards it will uh, never unfold that way because they will fail to complete an action before this can get completely out of control and they will go into turmoil at which point they will discard all of the non-trusted vizier cards and have to start the decree all over again with a new leader but until that time they can continue to add cards here and use any spare cards in their hand to take the reform action and try to manage this uh try to manage the decree and uh, keep the uh actions going for as long as possible now when you go into turmoil you just your trusted viziers will remain here they'll move but uh you don't discard them but you take the rest of your action cards that you've put down and discard those the next thing that happens is that uh, you must discard your leader so whichever leader you had he's discarded you can put him face down next to your board or whatever and then you look at the remaining leaders that you've not yet used this game you pick one of those and they become the new leader of the eerie so if you take, for example, the commander, we can see that the commander's actions are move and battle. So we will put down our two viziers in the move and battle slots. And um, we will now end our turn and we won't get any vi uh, victory points. And uh, that's the end of that. However, if we did not go into turmoil and we successfully completed our turn with our uh, charismatic leader or whoever we chose at the start, then um, we will go into the evening phase where we will score victory points and discard down to our hand limit. Our starting hand limit is four and we'll score victory points uh, based on the number of roosts that we've built. So then we're on to the uh, Woodland Alliance. You could uh, say the plucky heroes of our Woodland Adventure or you might say the cute fluffy little insurgents. So we see here on the top of the Woodland Alliance board that um, we've got our little story. Then we've got our victory points which uh, state that we gain victory points for conspiracies and crafting items. We've also got two hand size and one income. We've got special abilities hidden. If defending with one warrior, ignore the first hit in combat. We've also got cottage industry. Gain two extra, gain double victory points for crafting. So our main victory point income will be from conspiracies and crafting items. So first we've got our birdsong step, which says collect hideout cards and draw outrage cards. Well, we can hide, uh, we can store cards in our hideouts. More on that a bit later. We also draw outrage cards. If you remember this outrage track here below the stronghold track, which goes up whenever the Marquis de Cat play does a recruit action, we'll gain uh, extra cards during birdsong step if the uh, cube there matches any of the income numbers. So. After three outrages, you'll have a plus one card during the uh, bird song, plus two at five, and plus three at eight. And uh, it's worth noting this outrage track also increases if someone's army, their warriors, destroy one of your hideout buildings. But uh, it's probably not a good idea to let the hideouts get destroyed. The Woodland Alliance have easily the most actions of any faction in the game. That is to say, they have the most available actions. They've got nine total here on their board including um, spy, educate, train, craft, keep secrets, conspiracy, build hideout, build stronghold, and battle. So um, 
It's important to note that these costs all contain this fist. And what is the fist? Well, the fist symbol indicates supporters. These are our supporters, and they're kind of extra resources that the Woodland Alliance has to deal with. Supporters for each of the three nations in the forest, or the three factions in the woodland. We've got uh, mice, we've got, oh, we've got uh, bunnies, and we've got foxes. You start the game with no supporters. However, you can discard cards from your hand and gain a supporter matching any of the suits. And remember that the bird is wild, so you can add one supporter of any faction with a bird card. And when you gain supporters, you will just put them down here on your faction board like this. So that's the educate action. Gain a supporter of that nation. Now we've also got the spy action. In this case, you would uh, discard a card, plus uh, spend one supporter, and then you would draw a card. And uh, these can be any combination, really. So just uh, one card, one supporter, draw a card. We've also got the train option. Now, you must discard a bird card, plus one supporter, and then you can place a warrior of the type in this clearing. So, for example, you would discard a bird card and a mouse supporter, and then you would put a warrior in a mouse clearing. You could discard a bird card and a bunny supporter to place a warrior in a bunny clearing. Then we've got the craft action. Remember, this is tied into our strongholds. It's the same as all the other factions. The uh, strongholds will unlock the faction symbols, which will allow you to craft the craft portion of the card. We've got keep secrets. This is free, and it says play a card face down in one empty card slot. These are our card slots here, and these correspond to the hideouts. You can only use the slots if you've built the hideout to unlock the slot. So in this case, we've only got the mouse slot unlocked, but uh, we can keep a secret, and that means we put a card face down from our hand into this slot. We will draw this card again during the birdsong phase. Remember when it says collect hideout cards? This is the card that it's talking about. We've then got conspiracy, and it says spend supporters to play a card face up in a matching empty slot and execute it. So this is a bit uh, different. What we'll do is we'll play action cards from our hand for the conspiracies beneath them. So the conspiracy text, what this means is that we'll play the action cards from our hand for the conspiracy text beneath them. Now we'll only look at this bottom portion of the card and nothing else on the card. So we can ignore the suit and we can ignore the crafting text. And what we'll do is we'll uh, pay this number of supporters and we'll gain immediately what's on the cards here. Now in this case we've got one movement action and one victory point. And uh, when we play the card, we choose one of our card slots to play it to. So we've only unlocked the mouse slot, so we would pay, play the card to the mouse slot. But if we'd unlocked the other slots, we could use those as well to play more conspiracies. And uh, this conspiracy costs zero, so we won't pay any mice. But uh, if we were to play a different kind of conspiracy, we would then pay three mice supporters. And that's because it's three supporters here, and it's in the mouse slot. Note that when the card goes down, the uh, it will the conspiracy card will remain there face up occupying the slot for the rest of the turn, and uh, then uh, at the beginning of our next turn during the bird song step we will actually collect this card back into our hand. It's worth noting as well here that the uh, Woodland Alliance doesn't have any actual movement action that they can take during the daylight step, and the only way for them to move their warriors at all is by using these conspiracies on their action cards. And uh, because you collect the action card back at the end, uh, rather at the during the birdsong step, you can keep playing the same one over and over if you get a good one. The next action they've got is build a hideout. In this case, they'll discard two supporters to place a hideout in a clearing that matches the type of the supporters they discarded. So you'd pay two mouse supporters to put down a hideout in a mouse type clearing. And uh, this is great because you don't need to rule the clearing. That's really important. The hideouts can be built in clearings that you don't rule. However, if there's an army there, a standing army belonging to one of your opponents, they might just immediately wipe the building out. So you've got to be careful. But uh, the hideout also comes with one warrior, which is great because uh, he can help protect it if there's a standing army or something like that. Then for three supporters, we can build a stronghold. The stronghold, again, the supporters need to match the type of the clearing where you're playing the stronghold. Unlike the hideout, the stronghold does have to be built in a clearing that you rule. Finally, we can spend one uh, supporter and have a battle in a clearing that matches the type of the supporter that was discarded. And then we've got the evening, and uh, you gain one supporter in each nation, which is great because you'll need those, and uh, then you discard down to your hand limit. And uh, remember that you can use your uh, keep secrets 
and play conspiracy cards to your hideouts in order to help you uh, overcome the fact that your hand size is just two cards. Finally, we've got the Vagabond player board. Now this story here says you wander the woods seeking to secure a place in the new society that's taking shape. So you're kind of like a uh, sort of a jack of all trades, uh, sort of trying to take advantage of the situation. You score victory points by completing tasks and crafting items. You uh, have a special ability called Nimble, which allows you to move without the regular um, sort of move restrictions. That means that you can move into a uh, territory that's ruled by another player without their permission and uh, stuff like that. You've also got a hand size of three and an income of one. And uh, you've also got this reputation track. Now this is really important and we'll look at that a bit later, but uh, basically you can move around this track by doing different actions on your turn and uh, you'll gain victory points as you go up or down these uh, spaces and you can dart across the spaces as well. Manipulating this track is pretty key to winning and uh, but what's more key to winning is actually moving around the track. So we'll have a look at that a bit later on. So it says in the bird song step, you can do a slip, which is a free move. So during the slip move, you will move one space. This can be into or out of a forest. It can be into a clearing or across clearings. The slip is a free move and you ignore your different um, restrictions. Then you've got exhausted items become available. So over the course of your turn, you'll be using the items that you've got. In this case, we've started with four items. We've got a boot that allows us to move, a sword that allows us to do hits in combat, and two torches that allow us to do actions. And uh, these are currently in our available slot. As we use them over our turn to do actions, we'll move them to the exhausted space. So during the birdsong step, all of our exhausted tiles from the last turn come back into play. So the daylight step has uh, all our actions listed here. We've got move, battle, and craft. I think we've covered those. But uh, for the uh, purposes of the Vagabond, in order to take a move, you must take one of those boot tokens from your available space and move it to the exhausted space. Then you can move. We've got battle, that's torches. We looked at spending a torch just a moment ago. So you'll uh, move a torch from available to exhausted in order to carry out a battle. And we'll look at how the battle works with the Vagabond in a bit, because obviously it doesn't have an army or warriors. Then you can craft. The crafting works in much the same way as the other races or factions, but instead of having buildings and clearings and gaining tokens for those buildings, you have uh, hammers, which are tokens that you can have in your available section. And when you uh, exhaust a hammer, moving it to the exhausted section, you gain one uh, symbol for crafting based on the clearing that you're currently in. Again, this prevents the Vagabond from creating or crafting uh, items that have multiple faction symbols on them. But uh, it also means that if you get a bunch of hammers, you can craft a bunch of cool stuff. Then we've got Gift. This is a free action that the Vagabond can do as many times as they like. Well, not really, because the Gift involves giving a card to another player. Now, when you give a card to another player, you can uh, give it to any faction that's local. Local just means they're in the same clearing as you. In this case, the Vagabond is local to the Eerie Order and the Marquis de Cat. In that example we just looked at, the Vagabond could give cards to the Marquis de Cat and the Eerie Order. However, they were also in a mouse clearing, a mouse um, faction, a mouse nation clearing, which means that uh, the gift, the cards that, that he gifts to these other factions must be mouse cards, mouse suit cards, or bird cards, but not fox or bunny in the mouse clearing, damn it. As the Vagabond, when you are giving players cards as gifts, you can take in exchange any of the tokens that they've placed on their player board from crafting earlier. You can take one token per card that you gift them. Then you've got the repair action. You exhaust a torch to make a damaged item exhausted. Well, what are damaged items? I'll talk about those when I talk about how the Vagabond does battle. Then you can steal. So you have to have more swords than local players have warriors, and you can take a random card from that player, and they get one VP because you stole from them. But you might also get VP. Now remember, uh, our Roger the Raccoon Vagabond here starts with a sword. He also gets plus one combat strength when he's uh, stealing, which means that uh, if the Vagabond is in a clearing with, say, two Marquis de Cats, uh, so warriors, he cannot steal from the Marquis de Cat, but if one of them is dead, then he can steal from the Marquis de Cat, taking one of their cards at random. 
Then we've got the aid action. If a local hideout, Alliance gains one supporter in that nation. So basically, uh, if you aid in a clearing with a hideout, then the Woodland Alliance gains one mouse supporter for use on their turn. Note that the Vagabond also gains a victory point for each aid action that they take. Finally, we've got Explore. It says, add a local ruin token to exhausted items. Also gain a victory point. Remember these red bordered slots we looked at earlier? If the Vagabond comes into a clearing with a ruins in it, then he can take this Explore action. He will take the ruined icon, which we put out at random earlier, and he will put this in the exhausted space on his player board. And uh, in the next turn, when uh, the birdsong phase happens, this will unexhaust, and he will be able to use it as normal. It's worth noting as well, like, for example, with the gift, each faction discards cards at the end of their turn, which means that the cards that you gift them, they will be able to use on their turn, more than likely, and have more than they would otherwise start with. So this is quite a powerful way to influence people. Let's look at the reputation track. We've got one warrior from each of our different factions here available on the track. Now, there are very uh, many different ways to move around this track. You can uh, go up the track here towards the ally space and down the track here towards the hostile space. You go up the uh, allied side by gifting cards to a player. And uh, for example, if, you, if we were to give the Marquis de Cata card, we would move up here to the first slot because it says gift one card. We'd gain a victory point and uh, we would be here now, which is great. Now, for the next space, we'd gain two victory points, but we have to give two cards together and uh, that'll follow the same restrictions. So we'd have to be local to the Marquis de Cat and have two cards matching the um, faction of the clearing. And then we would go up to the next space and gain two victory points. And for two more cards, we can go up to the final space and gain three victory points. Now we're a full on ally of the Marquis de Cat. So the ability sort of resets any further cards we give the Marquis de Cat, we get two victory points per card. And uh, we are now good and strong allies. But at any time in any of these three positions, I can murder someone and go straight over here. So how do we become hostile? Well, the first time you steal from someone, you become hostile. I have looked everywhere and I can't figure out if you are up here on your way to becoming an ally and then you steal a card from someone, do you go back down to indifferent? It doesn't answer that question anywhere. I don't think you do because that could potentially be very powerful, allowing the Vagabond to just sort of swap between these two powers by giving and stealing the same card over and over again. So you've got to decide whether you're sort of interested in becoming an ally or a hostile. Note that it's very easy to get hostile with everybody, but uh, if you get to that space, you can't get out of it. Once you've made a good solid enemy of someone, that's unrecoverable. So uh, if you want to be an ally of someone, then maybe uh, this is the way to go. But uh, if you don't want to be their ally, you can steal a card from them. You'll gain a victory point and they will start becoming your enemy. Now, if they're still in this spot, they're not yet hostile, which is for these two spots. So you could give them two cards and shoot them straight over here for two victory points. And then they become uh, on their way to being an ally. But if you don't want them to be your ally and you want to keep on making enemies, then you can murder one of their people. This means murder a warrior. You'd gain two victory points for that and they would now be hostile with you. That means that uh, if you're moving into a clearing with them or moving out of a clearing with them, you have to spend an extra boot in order to do that move. So uh, one space counts as two. And then uh, if there's two hostile factions in there, then you need like four boots. It's crazy. So that becomes very difficult. So you've got to be mindful of making a lot of enemies. Then you can uh, murder two more warriors. You'll gain three victory points and now you'll be solid, unrecoverable enemies. And uh, you can continue to murder their warriors for two victory points per warrior. If uh, you murder any warriors belonging to any of the factions in any of these other slots, no matter which slot they're in, you murder a warrior, they'll jump straight over to this spot here, which is why there's all those arrows with a murdered warrior here pointing at this space. And uh, that's two victory points you'll get if you do that. But uh, on the other hand, this is now unrecoverable. You will be hostile against all factions forever. So now that we understand how the reputation works, how does the battle work? If the Vagabond is an ally of uh, any nation, he can use their warriors as though they're his own. So uh, if we're the ally of the Marquis de Cap, let's look at an example. In this example, the Vagabond is going to move into this space to do battle with the uh, Eerie Order. Now, he can take all of the cat warriors with him because he is an ally of the Marquis de Cat. 
The Marquis de Cat cannot say no. The Marquis de Cat cannot do anything about this. His warriors are completely in love with the charismatic vagabond. Now, this uh, in this case, we would pretty much carry out combat as normal. So we would uh, offer the uh, Eerie an opportunity to retreat, uh, where they could potentially lose uh, troops if they do. And if they decide not to retreat, we will roll dice and use ambush cards as we would normally. Now, uh, remember that uh, the mark that uh, you can only do as many hits as you have soldiers. We've got four soldiers here, so we can do three hits. That's fine. If, um, but uh, if we didn't have soldiers here, how would the vagabond deal with hits? Well, we'll talk about. I'll talk about that in a bit. But this combat will pretty much resolve as normal. In this case, I've rolled a three and a zero, so we can do three hits because we've got four warriors, and uh, the bird folk are going to lose three hits for none in return. That's a pretty. That's the perfect roll. Now, in this case, the uh, Vagabond is not as good allies with the, uh, the cat, uh, Marquis de Cat, as he might otherwise have been. So uh, when he goes in to do battle, he's going to be all by himself. Now, how do we resolve this conflict? Well, we still give the uh, Eerie an opportunity to retreat. If they decide not to retreat, then we do go on to rolling the dice as per normal. But uh, so here I've got a zero and a one. So uh, let's just make that a, uh, a one and a two. So the uh, Vagabond has two hits and the Eerie has one hit. So the Vagabond must discard swords in order to do his hits. In this instance, we've only got one sword. So we will discard this sword in order to, uh, and when I say discard, I mean exhaust. We will exhaust this sword in order to do the one damage. Now I've put it here, kind of at the side, and I'll explain why. Because our Vagabond is also taking one damage himself. Now when the Vagabond takes damage, he must move one item from the available space to the damaged space. If there are no items in the available space, then he must move an exhausted item to the damaged space. Now in this case, because we've just spent a sword, and uh, play is simultaneous in order to do a hit, we can actually take the sword we've just spent, count it as an available item, and move it to the damaged slot. That's a little weird, I know, because uh, we should really take one of our available items and move it to the damaged slot. It's only in the unique case where you've just spent swords as part of the same attack that you're now defending against, you can put those to take up the damage you would otherwise take. But uh, if we were to take three hits and uh, we had none in return, we would have to put all three of these symbols here into the damaged space. If uh, we only had two here and we took three hits, we would also put this sword from the exhausted space into the damaged space. Now remember, we can always take a repair action to make a damaged item an exhausted item. So just like the other factions, in the evening step, the Vagabond will discard down to their hand size, and then they will, uh, if they're in a forest space, the uh, damaged items will become exhausted, and uh, then it's back to the Marquis de Cat to start the process all over again. And turn continues until someone hits 40 victory points, and then they're the winner. Now, there's just one exception. What about those alternate victory cards? Let's have a look at them. So here we've got our four victory cards. You'll notice that they each have one of the uh, faction symbols on them, so they all have a suit and they can be used at that suit, suit type. So for example, you can use this fox card in your decree if you want to uh, move out of a fox clearing or if you want to have a battle in a fox clearing. You can uh, use this bird card as um, part of the, uh, to discard for an extra action with the marquee, etc., etc. But uh, unlike the other cards, they don't have a crafting option and they don't have a conspiracy on them either. In fact, what they've got at the top is an instruction on when to play them. This says play during daylight, which is the second phase of your turn. And uh, it says remove your scoring cube. So when you play this card, you'll take your scoring cube off of the victory point track and you will gain a new victory condition, which is called the military victory. And it says you win the game only if you rule the keep during birdsong. So your new victory condition is instead of getting 40 victory points, just rush the keep, try and control it. Note that you can't play this if you're the Vagabond or the Marquis de Cat. You can play the military victory card from your hand to adopt this new victory condition, 
Alternatively, uh, if you don't want to play it or you use it for regular uh, suit purposes, it will then go next to the board. Any other player uh, during their turn when they are the active player uh, can discard a card from their hand which matches the suit of the victory condition and then they will be able to pick up the victory condition. That's like a special action. They discard a matching card to grab this new card. Then when it's applicable during the daylight phase, for example, they can play it and uh, adopt the new victory condition instead of the 40 victory point victory condition. So the military victory, which uh, allows you, which in which you must conquer the keep. You've got the economic victory, which says uh, also play during daylight. It says uh, economic victory. You win the game only if you have crafted five improvements during birdsong. So during a birdsong step, if you have five improvements, you win the game. The chaos victory uh, says you win the game only if the other players have 33 or more points during birdsong. So if all other players have 33 or more points in the birdsong step, you win the game. This sort of encourages you to help even the game out and sort of uh, try to king make the losing player. But hopefully everyone sort of gets stuck between 33 and 40 before the game ends. Then you've got the coalition victory, which just says, when revealed, place your scoring marker on the faction board of the player with the fewest victory points. You win with them. So this kind of like forces you into an alliance with the losing player, but uh, your victory is no longer your own and you have a tied victory. So this would be great if there's two players who are doing very badly and they want to team up or something like that. And uh, this has the mouse suit. So remember, all of those will not go into the discard pile, but will be put next to the board and they'll be available for anyone to take by discarding a card of the matching suit. And that's a really cool thing, I think, to be able to sort of change up the... Um, victory condition over the course of the game if perhaps you're uh, not doing so well or um, you know you're you you think that uh, someone's got a runaway lead and you want to sort of try and uh, shake things up so a couple of uh, sort of quick tips about the game um, the marquee de cat is probably the simplest of the factions to play and they sort of go up in complexity with the Vagabond probably being, I would say actually the Woodland Alliance and the Vagabond seem about equal in difficulty to uh, to play. The Old Eerie Order uh, step up from the Marquis de Cat. The Marquis de Cat also comes out of the gate very, very strong, but uh, then uh, is often sort of um, prioritized at the beginning of the game by the other players and that sort of balances out and as the game goes on. The old Eerie Order sort of become a lot uh, stronger after they've built up some of their roosts because their income is cumulative. It's every um, evening phase they gain those victory points from their roosts. So once they've got a foothold with lots of roosts on the uh, woodland, it can be very difficult to get rid of them. They also get this recruit action as part of their decree every turn. So they'll have a big army and they can be quite scary. The Woodland Alliance, they... Um, they're, they're very difficult to play, I've found. You've got to sort of, they're sort of reliant on what conspiracies come up in this deck, and that can be uh, very difficult if they don't get the conspiracies they need. So they're sort of very reliant on card draw. Um, I think they, they're more interesting to play with the Vagabond. They can be a lot harder without the Vagabond, especially if the Marquis de Cat is taking a lot of recruit actions. But uh, if you are going in a Woodland, as the Woodland Alliance in a three player game, um, trying to convince the old Eerie Order to sort of attack the uh, cat and not you early on is pretty essential because uh, you need the cat to be recruiting stuff in order to get your card drop. But uh, also don't forget to build some strongholds as quickly as possible and get your income up that way as well. Uh, just uh, get those hands, hand sizes. Uh, don't underestimate your hideouts, but uh, losing a hideout can be really devastating because you lose uh, the ability to put down those cards, store those cards, if you have to discard cards, that's terrible. You don't want to do that. So uh, remember, your conspiracies can be played multiple times. So you can put a conspiracy down face up to play it. And then uh, during the birdsong step of the next turn, you'll draw back into your hand, which is great because you can keep sort of playing good ones over and over again. And it allows you to sort of tailor your hand to the, uh, to the conspiracies, or allows you to tailor your hand so it contains the conspiracies you really need to be effective. But uh, it also means that when you play the Conspiracy every turn, it's out of your hand. The only way for the uh, Woodland Alliance to increase their hand size that I'm aware of is by crafting items and stuff like that. So you will want to build your strongholds as well to help you craft stuff 
Remember, you've got Cartage Industry, which doubles your points from crafted items. And then the Vagabond. The Vagabond has a real power to turn the course of the game, giving away those gift cards, uh, especially powerful for the Woodland Alliance. And uh, I think as the Vagabond, helping the Woodland Alliance is probably a very good thing, unless, of course, they seem to have a lot of really powerful conspiracies right off the bat, in which case maybe don't help them out so much. But uh, you don't really want to help the Marquis de Cat very early on because you'll probably allow that player to get a runaway lead um, and then you'll sort of be trying to catch up. But um, don't forget to play the uh, the reputation tracker. It's not always necessary to become super allies with everybody, um, but uh, also you don't want to sort of commit too early to being a full-on ally or full-on hostile with someone, especially hostile, because uh, you can always go back to hostile from ally but you can't get back to ally once you start going down that hostile path. Um, so that's very important to think about. It's better to sort of wait and see how things are playing out. The first turns are often quite slow as things sort of build up and people sort of uh, react to what's going on. So uh, keeping an eye on things and uh, collecting those ruins really early is great. Um, this also gives players a chance to craft items and build up items on their player boards that you can then collect when you give them gifts. Okay, well, I think that's just about it. I hope I've covered everything. But uh, if you have any questions, please uh, leave a comment below. I've been reading up as much as I can on this and I've studied it quite thoroughly. So I should be ready to help you out with your root, print, and play. But, uh, or I'll do my best. And uh, if you want to see it in action, please come back tomorrow because I'll be playing through it with uh, my friend Matthew from his channel, Light of Hand. And also Michael Smith will be back as well to play with us then. So uh, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you all tomorrow.